All right, let's go. The Eagles are about to battle for Los Angeles, and Jalen Carter just put the rest of the NFC on notice. So let's talk about how the best defense in the league can get better, plus the real challenge ahead in limiting the Rams' playmakers. Also, with Devontae Smith officially ruled out, who needs to step up and how will that change Kellen Moore's game plan? And the Rams' pass rush has been strong up to this point, but why are they about to meet their match? Meanwhile, Q is about to take over the Defensive Rookie of the Year race. So let's talk about that and everything else ahead of the primetime matchup. But first, let's run it. What's up, guys? Do me a favor and drop a like because we got another primetime game for the Eagles. And unfortunately for LA, this is a Philly team who's entering the contest on a six-game win streak with a defense that's been otherworldly since the bye week. We got an infestation of God knows what, but they are not of this earth. Lawrence has time, looking for Johnson, and it's picked off! Daniels is back. Daniels steps up. Daniels is sacked! Back at the 34 by Nolan Smith! Look, it's kind of hard to comprehend the change we've seen over the last six weeks. Because for a unit that struggled to make tackles early in the season and at one point was tied for the last in takeaways, they're almost top 10 in the turnover game. Yeah, not gonna lie, the most remarkable stat is seeing how the Birds went from the poorest tackling team in the league through the first couple weeks to having the second fewest missed tackles in the league. Whoa, did you just make that up? No, although it's amazing how many people want to call it fake, or at least call the Vic Fangio defense a fraud. And sure, like I've said a couple times, there's some not-so-great teams on the schedule. But seeing the pass defense shut down Joe Burrow in Cincinnati, as well as the hot offense of Jaden Daniels and Terry McLaurin for Washington would, you'd think, silence the critics. Yet it hasn't which is fine and really just gives the birds a great opportunity with the lights, camera, action in Hollywood. I got it. Go back a bit, would you? All right, so despite the Rams entering the contest at 5-5, five and five, they're much better than the record suggests. I mean, heck, they started out 1-4 and four after dealing with a crazy amount of injuries, as well as turning the ball over and trying to figure out things defensively. But kind of a given, when Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua finally returned to the lineup, things have changed drastically, evidenced by their 4-1 and one record over the last five. So make no mistake, Fangio is making sure to not overlook them. Two really good receivers. They really have good karma, both of them, with Stafford. Um, they're strong at the catch point. Both of them are strong receivers. Both are excellent runners after the catch. And, you know, they, they have played, I don't know how many games, but more than a few without either one of them. You know, for them, for them to be at this point in the season with the injuries they've had speaks highly of their, of their players and their coaching staff. And, you know, now they're back pretty much to full strength offensively, and they'll be a tough group to defend. Yeah, it's pretty obvious to see the difference in their offense with their full complement of weapons. And maybe none more so than what Matthew Stafford's done since getting his top pass catchers back. As Stafford's ranked third in the NFL in passing yards and fifth in touchdown rate over the past four weeks. Add to that that Stafford is coming off a season-high 10.9 yards per pass attempt against the Patriots, and there's no doubt he's seeing the field well. Of course, on the flip side of that, the Eagles have allowed a league-low 5.2 passing yards per attempt and an absurd 1% touchdown rate over the last six weeks. So basically, we have a hot passing offense going up against a very hot pass defense. And let's just say Philly's got all of Stafford's attention. It's impressive what you see on tape. Um, they do a really nice job of you know disguising their looks and giving you a bunch of things to look at. And they're not wasting players in any kind of coverage or anything like that, right? They don't, they don't have somebody go care, cover an area of grass just to cover an area of grass if nobody's over there. So they're always trying to buy back defenders and do a great job of using the guys that they have on the field. And, and that's what makes this defense, uh, you know, a challenging one. This is one of those chess matches that I just cannot wait to see play out. But let's remember that Fangio kind of has Sean McVay's number when it comes to the recent history. Or maybe I should say the long ago history because it has been six years. Granted, the DC also did downplay it when asked about it. But that was a pretty memorable one, since Fangio's Chicago defense practically shut down the 11-1 Rams with Jared Goff throwing four interceptions and looking confused and flustered all game. FYI, that was the lowest point scored by the Rams that entire regular season, and ultimately led to McVay changing his offense while calling Fangio the most difficult defensive minds to prep and plan for. However, as Fangio said, that was a long time ago, and foolishly or not, McVay is actually very much looking forward to the rematch with Old Vic. You're entering a world of pain. I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, that's what you love about the NFL. They are red hot. They've played really well. They're finding their identity. They've got great playmakers, coaches, and scheme. You know, so they're checking all the boxes of what really good teams do. Um, and so that's that's what's a great challenge. It is a great opportunity. It's just one that I would argue the Eagles are going to take advantage of. But speaking of, you need to take advantage of the opportunity that Underdog is offering new customers. Where right now you can get a free Matt Stafford pick for the Sunday night football game when you scan the QR code and use code Philly Special at sign up. 
Oh yeah, you'll also get up to $1,000 in bonus cash when you use my link. Now, here's the good news. Despite Underdog not offering the pick'em options in Philly, they do allow you to play in Los Angeles. So if you're headed to the game, then take advantage of their insane discounts to win big with the Eagles in prime time. I figure it's easy money, you know, it's all pretty harmless. Well, that's what I thought last week, but then I took Jake Elliott to be Jake the Make, and we saw what happened. I don't know, I'm kind of wondering if I jinxed it. Dude, that's... That's just the stress talking, man. You know what? You're right. We're back at it this week because I'm feeling confident after hitting the four pick on Thursday night. So for Sunday night, let's go with Jalen Hurts over 221 and a half passing yards, an A.J. Brown anytime touchdown, Kyron Williams to get at least 15 receiving yards, and then Matthew Stafford to fumble the football at least once. As always, feel free to tell those picks and then swing by for the stream so we can sweat out the picks together. By the way, that last one may feel a little bit risky, but Stafford's actually fumbled the football three times over his last three games. It's just that he's actually recovered all three. So my feeling is, given Jalen Carter's track record in LA, the bread man can make it happen, and the Eagles can come away with at least one takeaway, especially since the Philly pass rush has the fourth fastest average time to pressure this season. Meanwhile, the Rams are allowing pressure at the second worst rate in the NFL. Honestly, saying that does make me consider a Josh Sweat anytime sack now. But either way, though, JC's got a warning that the pass rush hasn't even gotten close to their ceiling. No, no, we're not close. No, we got some dogs, man. Like I said, you know, the 66 snaps, it helps somebody else from getting play, playing time. But when their time is come is up, they go show out and you go see it. Yeah, I got to take the defense. And if you want to join the best option in fantasy sports, then scan the QR code, use my code Philly Special, or just click the link in the description where you can get up to $1,000 bonus cash on your first time deposit. Now look, the Rams have a formidable front and can get to the quarterback too, as they get pressure on 38% of dropbacks, which is third in the league, which is not necessarily the greatest sign for the Eagles when it comes to the analytics. Since Hertz has struggled a bit when facing that pressure, of course, yes, there's a joint effort when it comes to not having the best route combinations to throw to. But Jalen's only completed 50% of his passes under pressure for just over five yards in those situations. Having said that, let me just pause and say, I hear you, I understand, it's never one thing contributing to the inconsistencies. But when it comes to protection, it is something that Kellen Moore admitted the birds are focused on with L.A. I think they have, you know, a really, really talented defense line. You know, a bunch of young guys that are playing extremely well, high level. Uh, they give you a lot of different looks, a lot of different presentations, which can be challenging throughout the week, just as you get comfortable going, anticipating going against these guys. And so I think these guys are playing really, really good football right now. They've been playing really well coming out of their bye week. You can tell they took advantage of a bye week and they're playing, playing as well as anyone. He's not wrong. I mean, the D-line is definitely a strength of the Rams defense. Most notably, Byron Young, who leads the team with six sacks. And then Jared Verse, who has four and a half sacks as a rookie and is currently leading the Defensive Rookie of the Year race. But yes, Q is going to have his opportunity. But still, I should say it's not a fluke for what Verse is doing. He's twitchy. Uh, he's strong. I think, you know, when I look at really good edge rushers, um, you know, they can beat you with power. So he does have that. But I think when you look at him on the film, he just has terrific burst, good bend, and you know, that's why guys from Florida State like that go first round. Okay, I can appreciate the humility, and I don't want to get overconfident, but Verse is about to meet his match because most of his snaps will be against Jordan Mailata. And with most of the Rooks' moves being power, like Jimmy Kimsky said, Mailata is a brick wall versus power. Plus, the incredible luxury is that Philly literally has two of the best tackles in the league, with Lane and Jordan being asked to go one-on-one -on -one with zero help at the highest rate while also rarely ever making a mistake, which honestly is why I really think it comes down to how well the Eagles' interior O-line performs. Of course, that's mainly against rookie Braden Fisk since he's entering the contest with the third quickest pressure rate in the league so far. And obviously, don't forget about Kobe Turner as both interior guys have five sacks each. But I'll say it again, this is the main area if the Eagles want to have success. Because when Jalen's kept clean, he's had the second best efficiency rating in the league, completing nearly 80% of his passes for almost 10 yards per throw. Granted, that may be a little bit more difficult without Devontae Smith, as the Slim Reaper was officially ruled out with a hamstring injury. And I'll get to more of him later, but I would expect to see Britton Covey log significant snaps in LA after getting in three full practices this week. Also, this is just another reason why I'm going with AJ Brown to be the first touchdown scorer. Speaking of which, shout out to Underdog because they're back to partner for the first touchdown scorer giveaway. So take some time. Again, think about this one. Who is going to be the first touchdown scorer of the game? And then do me a favor, go on down and hit the like button if you haven't already before eventually typing in the comments who that first touchdown scorer will be, where if you get it right and the Eagles win, then I'm going to give out any NFL jersey of your choice, which I will draw for at the end of the game on my live stream. So as always, good luck to you, and this probably goes without saying, but just to make sure you do have to be subscribed to the channel to be taking part in the giveaway. Anyway, considering the Eagles will be without Devontae and the other intriguing storylines leading up to the game, I had to get Pro Football Network NFL analyst Anthony DeBona's thoughts to discuss that and everything else around the birds. 
Devontae Smith, he had not practiced all week, and so it was kind of you know leading up to maybe not as surprising, but still a little bit knowing Smitty and that he's going to push through every injury. Officially out, will not play for the Sunday night football matchup. Uh, curious to get your thoughts and obviously impact for the Birds. Yeah, it's just it seems like it was kind of leaning in this direction once you saw him miss that second consecutive practice. Now Friday made it the third consecutive practice, so it seems like in the last two weeks or so he's been managing this hamstring injury and trying to play through it, but. Finally, it seemed like it just reached the point where it just became too much and the right decision is to kind of just let him sit out. Now the, the question becomes, is it going to be a multi-week injury like A.J. Brown dealt with with his hamstring earlier in the season? Or if it's just going to be a one-game thing and he could be back for a big matchup against Baltimore next week? So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But they, they kind of built up a decent room as far as receivers go beyond A.J. Brown with, with Jahan Dotson, Johnny Wilson, potentially Britton Cuffey returning as well. So they'll have options. It's just going to be interesting to see how they kind of fill that void with Smith being out this week. It is interesting too, as you mentioned, uh, you see the video of Devonte Smith and, and kind of walking in the tunnel. I believe John Clark was the first one to, to post that. And you know, it's, it's a, a ginger walk, a little gingerly walk, not, not a hundred percent, but there's also, you know, you can go back and forth on it and say, well, yes, they need all hands on deck regardless. Cause it's the NFL rest him, you know, the other side say rest him. You've got Baltimore the following week and, you know, no game is, is easy, but you certainly want him for the long duration and the long stretch run that you're hoping to make. Um, still, if we look at what Smitty had done previously, you brought up a great point uh, for those, you know, stats or people wondering, you know, Smitty being in this mini slump of sorts, possibly having to do with the hamstring. Yeah. So in the first seven games of the season, he was kind of on a tear. And as far as a per game average through those first seven games, he averaged five receptions for 67.6 yards per game and 13.5 yards per reception while also having all four of his touchdowns in those first seven games that he played in. And then these last two weeks where he's been on the injury report with the hamstring injury, despite being able to play, he's only averaged three receptions per game for just 21.5 yards per game and just 7.2 yards per reception and no touchdowns. So basically his numbers were more than cut in half in, in several categories and it's clear that he's kind of been limiting with, with that injury. So the, the Eagles finally decided to kind of just let him have a week off. And like I said, we'll see if it develops into a multi-week injury or if it's just this one game. But it's going to be a kind of a tough blow because we saw them in week four when they didn't have both A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. So that was kind of a different beast. But Devontae Smith plays a key role in this offense. They've been able to kind of survive these last two games with him being limited. So they should still be able to beat the Rams regardless of if he's playing or not. And obviously we know now that he's not playing. So... We'll see if they can pull it out, but they have more than enough talent to win this game. I'm glad you brought that up because the the instant reaction and, and, and you know, there, there's part of me too, right? When I see, oh, Smitty's officially out, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, but it, it's not the end of the world. Saquon Barkley's still here. Like you say, AJ Brown, the, what we've seen from Jalen Hurts. Uh, and we also can get into this as well because Britton Covey got the 21 day practice window activated. Uh, not officially at the time of this recording on the roster, but I mean, I'm feeling like it's it's all signs pointing towards Britton Covey. You texted me before we recorded this, and we're like, take all the over props on Britton Covey that you can. So, I mean, I think we're all leaning in that direction. But why could this potentially be, you know, the the return of Britton Covey, but the Britton Covey season in LA? Well, I tweeted that out earlier this week. Once the whole Bryce Huff injury uh, came out, that they said that. He might be placed on IR. And then I was like, oh, that's awfully convenient timing with Britton Covey opening his practice window. And now we know Devontae Smith is going to be out. But just look at what happened in in that Saints game where it's right before he got hurt, where it seemed like Britton Covey was going to have a much bigger role in the offense. And he caught three receptions in the first first quarter or whatever it was. It seemed like he was going to be really involved, and especially in the slot where Devontae Smith has kind of been playing a majority of his snaps. He's played over 52% of his snaps in the slot. So it just seems like naturally, if Britton Covey is activated for the game, he seems like kind of a seamless target to, for Jalen Hurts to kind of rely on because although it's a lot of screens and short passes, he's caught all seven of his targets this season. So it's an efficient a sufficient target that Jalen Hurts trusts. And I know it's only seven catches for 32 yards or whatever it might be, but just the fact that it's a player that he trusts and we've seen him also develop his, his trust with Jahan Dotson in the recent weeks, kind of throwing up those 50-50 balls to him and having a little bit better of a relationship there as well. And that's another thing I would point out is over the last three weeks, which kind of coincides with when Devontae Smith has been dealing with his hamstring injury, all of a sudden, Jahan Dotson's playing over 52% of his snaps in the slot as well. So I don't know if this is just them kind of prepping or, or kind of filling that void that, that Smith's been, been dealing with, but 
now that he will be out, it'll be interesting to see if Jahan Dotson plays an even higher clip of his snaps in the slot as well. Okay, so that could be something to take note of. Uh, we, we still haven't seen a whole lot of production. It's, it's been more, like you said. Hopefully, you know, continue that because you're not going to have Devontae Smith. And certainly against this Rams defense, they can be got in terms of the secondary. You look at the, the playmakers that they have or the lack of uh, production. Uh, they've gotten some, certainly, from uh, uh, Cameron Kitchens. And uh, the, the defense has been better, I guess, the last, what, three or four games as opposed to earlier in the season. And it's all reciprocal. you got the offensive issues and things like that. But, um, I mean, all of us are hoping for, right? Like, you make the trade for John Dotson, you want to see a little bit of production, certainly when you have a guy like Devontae Smith go out. But it is going to be, you know, curious to see, is it Britton Covey? Is it more of Jahan Dotson now? Or you mentioned Johnny Wilson. I mean, you know, the dude got some presence in terms of the red zone targets at least. So do we see a game from uh, from Johnny Wilson to continue this? I'm, I'm interested. Uh, if you had to, I guess, predict, I won't ask for exact percentage, but if you had to predict, um, would you go with one receiver over the others, not that you know they're not going to have any targets or catches, but one in particular. I mean, I thought last week was going to be the, the Jahan Dotson revenge game. He got that that first play right off the bat, and it seemed like oh, they were going to get him really involved, and it ended up being his only reception. So, I mean, it feels like we keep waiting for this Jahan Dotson kind of breakout game, but this could be where it happens because, like I said, he has been playing more of his, his snaps in the slot recently, and now that Devontae Smith is out, and we still don't really know what's going to happen with Britton Covey. So. Jahan Dotson's kind of naturally that next guy in line behind, obviously, A.J. Brown. So maybe it means Dallas Goddard gets worked into it. Maybe they just use a lot more 12 personnel with Grant Calcaterra out there, and he, he's getting more targets recently as well. And maybe they'll reward him with a big game after that huge fumble recovery last week. So we'll see what happens. But they just have – they're in a much better position, I think, because they've been able to kind of rotate these guys in. Like you said, Johnny Wilson. I'm sure we'll see a Nia Smith on one of those – useless motions that they use all the time and then they never give them the ball. So <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see what they do in terms of who they utilize, but I think it'll be kind of a revolving door to see what kind of sticks. And given the lack of size in, in Los Angeles' secondary with their corners both being listed, I think generously listed at 5'10 or 5'9, I think you might see maybe them go a little bit heavier with Johnny Wilson in the slot and just running it at them and send forcing them to stop it that way because we've seen Johnny Wilson operate in the slot or where they have him, Grant Calcaterra, and Dallas Goddard all on the same side with A.J. Brown on the opposite side. So we could see some of those heavier packages like that as well to kind of counteract their, their smaller secondary. I like that. We get Saquon Barkley involved. It's a better blocking, uh, get everything out on the edge. Wouldn't mind that. Um, certainly within, I mean, you, know, you look at uh, obviously the, the different playmakers, but Jalen, um, was a little bit, Jalen Hurts was struggling just a little bit early in the game. He, he, he played better as, it, as time went on. You know, you had some people say that he played terrible and got a lot of hate for that of, of people going to that extreme. They still won the game, but ultimately no one's going to tell you that it is good football to wait until the fourth quarter to score a touchdown. So hopefully, I mean, I believe LA's last in the league when it comes to first quarter point differential. I don't know if that necessarily plays into our favor, though, because it's like, can we capitalize? Can Philly capitalize and go down and score early? But the ultimate, you know, you want to take care of business in this game is march down on your opening drive, score a touchdown, and then be able to use the running game. Not that you wouldn't on the first drive, but certainly as the game plays out where you're not having to do this catch up or late start. And, you know, then all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, this is going to be a definite game because uh, the, the Rams are going to to, to give, give you all that you want. It's certainly where they've been headed and the, tr- the, uh, the trending that they are right now. But um, I don't know. Do you think that the Eagles can finally get on the board? Um, it feels like, you know, again, this is like the every single week question. And I thought we were past it because, you know, oh, there's a, there's a field goal. Oh, there's a touchdown. But, you know, it's, it's a touchdown until the fourth quarter. Do you think that they get a, a start early? Well, hopefully Jake Elliott can make some kicks in the dome. So that would be nice to start, get some points on the board <laughs> that way. But Jake. I mean, if the, I, like you said, the opportunities are going to be there for them to put points on the board. It's not like this. I know the, the Rams have a plenty of like young players. You got Byron Young, Jared Verse, Braden Fisk, a lot of younger guys that are getting a lot of attention. And they're not to be taken lightly. I think they have a lot of talent on the defense, but they haven't necessarily put it all together where they have these dominant performances like we've seen from the Eagles themselves. So. There's going to be plenty of opportunities there. I mean, they gave up 22 points to the Patriots last week, so it's not like they're they're shutting anybody out like the Eagles are, limiting them teams to to single digits and things like that. But like you said, it's just a matter of the Eagles kind of almost getting over themselves where they're not making these silly plays and like late penalties on third down, forcing them into third and long, things like that. Because 
it seemed like they were going to score a touchdown on that first drive last week. And then sure enough, they had a holding penalty or whatever it was and kind of knocked them back. They had to kick a, a long field goal and we know what happened from there. So if they can kind of just get out of their own way, I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities because like I said, Los Angeles has a smaller secondary and you could really see a guy like AJ Brown have a huge game this week. I, I will also say that I probably jinxed it in terms of Jake Elliott. So I I picked him in the, the parlay never again. I've, I've made Oh, yeah. Game. I was going to say, don't, not, don't pick him this week. <laughs> it will not happen. He's not entering the parlay at all. I'm staying away from it. So uh, my apologies to Jake. But, you know, at least as you mentioned with the Dome, hopefully that leads to, you know, a little bit better production. Um, a, a get right game for Jake. You know, go like three for three, fill goals, you know, uh, three for three, four for four, extra points. Just have a have a really good game. No worries, no issues. Just there you go with your it. your forty point predictions again. Well, you know, like, yeah. hey, what's the, what's wrong with it? If we score forty points though without uh, Smitty, <laughs> I mean, you know, people be like, okay, hey, hey now, uh, which is funny because Saquon said, I think two weeks ago in a press conference, he's like, you know, we're we're just beginning to scratch the surface, or maybe it was this last week, but we're just beginning to scratch the surface in terms of the offense. And like, you know, I would believe that. I'm sure that you believe that. Lots of people would because we see these inconsistencies. And, you know, I understand people want to point to, yeah, but they scored 28 points here. They scored 34 points here. They scored, they're scoring points at a decent clip, a a pretty good clip. And still overall, they're a top five offense in the league, but there are those inconsistencies. So that's the scary part is if they put everything together where this team could be. But it's interesting that you've also got a Jalen Carter who goes on on record uh, was asked um, on Friday and saying like you know hey what do you, what do you expect for this defense the uh, the D line but also the defense as a whole and he's like oh no like we we got a lot more and you know it's like that's cool but bro you're you're the number one defense in the league now sack wise sure we could say yeah they could get a little bit more but like number one defense in the league and you're kind of going out there and be like yeah just wait just wait, there's a little bit more to that. So um, it gets me excited, but curious, you know, your thoughts hearing that, obviously we'll get into the, you know, Bryce Huff and other news on that side for the D line. But um, I don't know, just hearing that from Jalen Carter, can the defense and maybe in particular the D line get even better? Well, I think honestly, if you look as like holistically at the Eagles defense, I feel like the defensive line outside of maybe Jalen Carter and and maybe your boy Nolan Smith is kind of underperformed this season, given the expectations that they had kind of coming into the air, even probably Jalen Carter as far as a strictly sack like total number. But then mm-hmm. again, I feel like those are, you really have to factor in hurries and things like that, go a little bit deeper in, as far as that regard to see a player's impact. But I just think like, you, like kind of like the Rams in terms of how young their defensive front is, but they are getting all of the sack numbers and they're putting up those stats that are getting the attention and why you see Jared Verse leading defensive rookie of the year, maybe not after Sunday night. We'll see how Quinion Mitchell does, but there we go. It's, I just it's think, cute, we're, I just feel like we've seen, Philadelphia's defensive front as far as that obviously not the linebackers the linebackers have far exceeded anybody's expectations but as far as the edge rushers and, and the interior de- defensive line I just feel like there is still room for them to grow and we haven't actually seen them at their best because a lot of these guys are hitting their stride now which is really exciting because last season it felt like they were kind of starting to die down at this point of the year where they were starting to struggle and people were saying Jalen Carter was hitting that rookie wall or whatever they said but whereas this year he just had a game where he played 100% of the snaps for the first time and was dominant from start to finish. So he didn't really slow down at all. So the fact that they're going against the Rams offensive line that is going to be probably using their seven different starting offensive line this season. They've been decimated by injuries or guys, they signed Jonah Jackson to a huge contract and then he was benched just a couple games into the season and they've kind of been rotating guys and who knows who's going to start at right tackle with Rob Havenstein being doubtful. It seems like they're going to lean towards Joe Noteboom. But then if you look on Twitter, all the Rams fans are kind of killing him and they want them to start Warren McClendon Jr. instead. So we'll see what happens with their <laughs> offensive line, but it hasn't really been pretty for the Rams. They played well last week, but we'll see if they can keep it up. It is it is an absolute mess. Uh, and and I, I credited you uh, in a previous video as well, but obviously with the, the uh, pressure numbers and everything like that, I believe what Eagles were fourth highest, uh, yeah. fourth fastest pressure rate. Um, and then the, the Rams are what the last or the second to last they, in they, terms of allowed. they give up the fastest pressures when yeah, they do give yeah. up pressure. It's the fastest in the league and the Eagles, they don't get a crazy amount of pressures, but when they do, it's at the fourth highest rate in the league. So it seems like a perfect matchup for the Eagles to kind of take advantage of the Rams. It's just a matter of, you know, Sean McVay and, and Matthew Stafford are going to try and get rid of that ball in under two seconds and, and not give them any chance to do that. So we'll see what happens. And so that's the question, actually, too, because with um, Havenstein being out, 
I had some questions, you know, like someone going, oh, do you expect the Eagles to get, you know, a lot of sacks or who would that come from? Or naturally with the right tackle is, is Sweaty. Is Josh Sweat going to have a game? So if you had to predict, do you, do you think that Sweat gets a sack on Stafford? Do you think that that would be a decent pick in terms of going with a sack? Well, I, th- I think he sacked them last year, if I, if I remember correctly. So I think he might be able to do it again. I know he's wearing that different number, and okay. I was harsh. I, I criticize him a lot for changing that jersey number, but <laughs> yes. he's making that, that ugly number 19 that, that J.J. Arcega-Whiteside went to wear. He's making it look pretty good this year. So It has I gotta been get him, I, th- I, think, I think he will get a sack this week. I think, like I said, even if they go Warren McClendon Jr., who played well last week, or Joe Noteboom, or if Havenstein is able to play, I think either way, I think they're going to put him in a position where they're eventually going to get one down. Maybe the Eagles press a little bit more to try and take away that quick game that the, the Rams will will use with motion and whatnot. So maybe they kind of get their hands in the receivers by the defensive line a little bit more time and we'll see a couple of sacks. I don't think it's going to be a six plus sack game from the Eagles, but even if they can get two or three and then get Matthew Stafford kind of moving because he, I think he's the only quarterback in the NFL that hasn't scrambled this season yet. So he's kind of been a statue in the pocket. So wow. if they kind of just get to him, yeah, I think it's 400 and something consecutive snaps that he hasn't scrambled and he's reaching like, Peyton Manning and Eli Manning territory as far as that regard goes. Uh, I'll double check on that, but I saw that on the next gen stats where he's reaching like official statue territory. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, the, he's not moving. The, the magically just, just spontaneously end up running, you know, taking off and running. You would think he would do that, but. Okay, well, he's actually either taking the sack better. or getting rid of the ball. So. Because I, I'm taking a Matt Stafford fumble because he's he's fumbled three times in the last three games. They've all been recovered, but I'm taking a Matt Stafford fumble loss, and that makes me feel better if he's just going to be a statue in the pocket if he holds on to it long enough. I, I hear yeah. you, I think, you know, understandably that uh, Sean McVay wants to get back at Fangio um, and actually have a, a good performance. But if if the quick game kind of stops hitting or the Eagles get a lead, then you might force them into taking a little bit more time. And and I like it. Okay. So then we go Josh Sweat, strip sack, and I'll just go ahead and say Nolan Smith recovers the fumble. Although I'll, I'll, it's probably Zach Bond. If we're be, I mean, that's probably who's going to be on it, but I'll I take th- Nolan. At this point, the league has to investigate his gloves. He's got to have like magnets in there or something because the football just finds that guy somehow, whether it it's does. a pass breakup or a fumble recovery or a force fumble, that guy is just... I mean, shout out to to my man Zach Bond because he's just killing it. He's been un- unbelievable. I mean, he, he's uh, absolutely needing to be extended. It probably won't happen until the off season, but you know, it, it's just he's he's playing unreal. Uh, that signing has turned out really great. The one you know where I'm going. The one that has not is Bryce Huff. You know, you sign a guy for fifty one million dollars. You're not expecting to have the lack of production, the lack of fitting into Fangio's scheme, the lack of being a every down pa- pass rusher, every down edge uh, on the system, and then oh by the way, you have the wrist injury, which you know I mean I know, I know that's unplanned. You you don't cause that. You don't wish injuries on anybody, but still you just have another thing. It's like oh wow, okay, not a lot of production and an injury, so he's out. He's on the IR. Uh, at least four weeks, who knows if and when he will come back and, you know, will he contribute? But ultimately, you know, I, I took the silver lining, the glass half full approach of, well, you don't wish any injuries on anybody, but it's not a huge loss. Like this is not a huge impactful. And, and you were saying it a second ago, you know, I'm asking you, can the defense get better? Can the pass rush get better? I'm still totally believing in that because of the lack of what we saw there, but just uh, a little bit more of your thoughts on, on the Bryce F situation, Long-term ramifications, obviously, for him coming back, but then also, also just for the team, um, you know, current state and what that means. It's funny because if you go back to like before the season when we were talking about long-term, like the Eagles' edge situation, even after they signed Bryce Huff, I think both of us said that we could see a point where towards the end of the year where Nolan Smith and Jalex Hunt were kind of their top edge players, and now we're with Bryce Huff going down. And I know we just kind of credited Josh Sweat for how well he's playing, and he is. Mm-hmm. But as far as just like a versatility standpoint. I think Nolan Smith and Jalex Hunt kind of offer the most in terms of being able to drop in coverage, being able to to hold the edge against the run, and then also being able to rush the passer. So I'm just interested to see kind of Jalex Hunt get an opportunity these next four weeks, or if it's even longer than that, depending on, like you said, Bryce Huff's kind of injury timeline. But yeah, I don't really think it's a massive hit to their defense because we've already seen Bryce Huff's, even with the injury, even before the injury, his workload was kind of declining. I mean, granted, they tried to use him in those wide nine alignments and obvious pass rushing downs. And he was seeing some success, but at the same time, paying a guy $51 million to play 10 to 15 snaps just didn't look like the best investment. So it's kind of the complete opposite of the Zach Bond situation where 
they kind of switched positions. They they saw what happened, and now he's kind of exceeded all expectations, and he's not really being compensated fairly for given what he's doing. Whereas Bryce Huff, mm-hmm. they've kind of projected saying, "Oh, he can be a full time rusher," and then we've seen how that's panned out. So it just kind of shows you the different dynamics of free agency and how it's really just so uncertain, and you don't really know what's going to happen until you get the guys in your building and on the field. So, but yeah, I think moving forward between Josh Sweat. Nolan Smith is playing really well. He's playing really well, especially since the bye week. Brandon Graham, obviously, you can't forget about him. And then, but most most notably, I'm just really excited to see Jalen Hunt because I talked about him leading up to the draft before the, he was even in Philadelphia. Just how much I loved his skill set and his upside as a player in the NFL. So now it'll be fun to see him hopefully get 15 to 20 snaps or maybe even more in a game for the next four weeks. You did, and shout out to you because if if uh, you're not following, you should be following Anthony on Twitter at Debona NFL. Uh, we, we, you said it before we, we had all the breakdowns, um, uh, and, and talking about, you know, I was asking you, Hey, who should we keep an eye on going all the way back to even before the combine. And it's just cool to, to go back and see that, you know, or then even as it transpired, cause Johnny Wilson, that was your guy well beforehand. Then it's like, Oh my gosh, the Eagles got him. Same thing there. Uh, Jalex hunt, like you mentioned, the fact that he's got the coverage versatility of being a safety and then converted to a pass rusher. Um, it's just going to be fascinating, I think, because you do see that versatility. You do see him being comfortable in coverage. So, you know, ultimately, I think, um, as we're saying there, Bryce Huff was not giving you a whole lot of production. You have a guy that does have versatility in Jalex Hunt. If he picks this thing up and you're able to get this thing going in the next four weeks, I mean, Bryce Huff may be a, no offense to him, he may be kind of a little bit forgotten. And you say, well, good that you're back. You know, we have some depth, but... Fangio admitted the very first day of training camp, let alone these last couple of weeks, is like the best player is going to play. Like, I don't care what you're making on contract. I don't care anything else. The best player is going to play and we're going to get production. Um, and, you know, I guess at the end of the day, if everything equals out, you got a $1.6 million linebacker that's an all pro and you have a $17 million edge rusher who's a fourth string, then, you know, I guess it's, it's all gravy at the end of the day. I don't know. It's crazy. Just just swap the contracts and nobody will even bat an eye. It'll <laughs> it's be, just, yeah, it'll be like, perfectly fine. <laughs> Except for Brian, After the season, Brian's be like, wait a minute, hang on. Hey, hey Zach Bond, you you want a three year, fifty one million dollar contract? Mm-hmm, there you go. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll just we'll just trade this guy right here and you'll fill that Perfect. gap. There you go. You just go ahead and take it. <laughs> I should also point out, because I'm sure I'll get a couple comments and everybody says this, you know, stop hating on Bryce Huff and everything. We want him to do well. Like, it's just so far he struggled to adapt. And we, we talked about it beforehand. Pass rushing specialist coming over. Fangio mentioned it a number of times. We saw it even in training camp. We saw it in the preseason. He, he was making strides. He was getting a little bit better. And then, yes, the injury makes it a little bit worse, too, because you can't obviously use one of your hands um, with the wrist. And you kind of had the, the club or the cast on. But um, you know, it is what it is. Like you started seeing other guys that are playing better. As you mentioned, Nolan Smith, love seeing my guy, you know, finally start to, to live up to expectations. And, and maybe I've been a little bit obnoxious of letting other people hear it, but I'm like, maybe we don't give up on a rookie that we got first round who played, you know, seven snaps a game average or something like that, you know, with defensive coordinators that clearly didn't have a clue of what they were doing compared to Vic Fangio. So, um, well, it's also not to cut you off, but it's just interesting timing because looking back at last season, it felt like it was around this time of the year where we saw Nolan Smith kind of get his shot, get a little bit of a couple of snaps. And now we're seeing almost identical timing where Jalex Hunt is all of a sudden going to have a role. I mean, granted a couple of mm-hmm. games ago, he had those, those 20 snaps or whatever it was, but now he's going to have, like I said, at 15, 20, maybe even more snaps for a couple of games in a row. And we'll be able to see if he could actually build on it, learn from what he's doing and, and really see what he's able to do in the NFL. I'm excited. I cannot wait. Um, hopefully again, continue it on. With this one in LA, something to prove. As we said, this is a team that started out one and four, and in the last four weeks they've been four and one. So they're, they're a better team than you just look at the record and go, oh, 500 team, eh, maybe middle of the pack. They're getting healthy at the right time, despite maybe not having a right tackle, but you have Cooper Cup, you have Puka Nakua, they have a lot more weapons. Um, interesting to see. Does the defense, are they able to limit them? Can Q win the matchup that he's gonna have? It's a great situation when we talk about defensive rookie of the year. You're going to have both guys prime time. The lights are brightest. Everyone is going to see who ends up being this. And you could have a huge, I mean, you, you probably will, unless both guys have really good games, but you probably have a really big change, whether it's Jared Verse continuing his, his uh, lead and just, you know, basically running away with it at that point. Or if Q, dare we say he finally gets an interception, but if Q has another good game, even if he just locks up someone, but if he gets an interception, then, you know, 
my gosh, look out. Uh, but he could vault into the lead there. So um, I'm curious to get your thoughts, takeaways. What what are just you know a couple of the biggest matchups? One's a given, I know, but but biggest matchups uh, positionally and things that you're keeping an eye on for Sunday night. Well, you just mentioned the Rams like star receiver duo, so I have to start with there because for sure Cooper. It's, it's going to be a Cooper versus Cooper matchup because Cooper Cup plays primarily in the slot, and we know obviously Cooper DeGene is is a slot cornerback for the Eagles, so that's going to be a massive test for him. We've seen him. Not, I mean, he's played really well, but he, he struggled a little bit for like these quicker guys that are a little twitchy. So we'll see if he can stay in front of Cooper Cup and, and be able to kind of make plays against him. But that's going to be easily his toughest task so far. And then on the same same side, well, on the same field, you're going to have Puka Nakua, who play, primarily plays on the outside. Obviously, he'll be facing either Darius Slay or Quinion Mitchell, which is the matchup everybody wants to see because Quinion Mitchell is a physical guy. He likes talking trash. And Puka Nakua is one of the toughest receivers in the league. It seems like he always kind of has a smile on his face, but that guy can take a hit and just keep going. So he's really, really talented. The way Sean McVay uses them and, and moves them around is going to make things difficult for the Eagles. But what you've seen this defense is a lot different than a couple of years ago when they didn't have any idea what to do with pre-snap motion and things like that. This, is, this defense seems like it's on a string at times with how guys just pass players off in zone coverage or fall within pre-snap. It's just a much better defense overall, and it's going to be really exciting to see those wide receiver cornerback matchups. And on top of several other matchups as far as the Eagles offense against the Rams defense where Rams linebacker Christian Rosebaum, he's not very good in coverage. He's allowed 31 receptions on 39 targets for 334 yards. And here's the crazy Yikes. part. 262 of those yards are after the catch. So he's only had <laughs> wow. average wow. of targets okay. about three to four yards, but he's just, I don't know if he's whiffing on the tackles or he's just being beat off the line of scrimmage because he's giving a ton of yardage after the off to the catch. So, this could be a huge game for whoever gets matched up on him, whether it's Dallas Goddard or Saquon Barkley on those wheel routes mm-hmm. out of the backfield. This could be a game where the Eagles kind of feast on the Rams linebackers in that regard. So those are definitely the matchups that I'll be watching for. I love here. I mean, yeah, the fact that it doesn't get much worse than those numbers. Quite. I mean, you going yeah. through the list of that, like – Immediately Allowing about consider, an, an 80% completion percentage is yeah, probably not it, ideal. It, it feels like last season's linebackers for Philly is quite honestly where I would go with that. But uh, okay, I like that. To take advantage of, and it's, it's you know, a, at least a blessing in disguise maybe because even though Smitty may be out, as you said, Dallas Goddard, possibly Saquon Barkley, maybe even Kenny G. You know, it does make you think of the dump off that, that Jalen had to um, Saquon in whatever it was, second quarter, I think it was second quarter or third quarter, that it was like, I mean, man, if he, if he would take that throw so much more off, because it's right there, it's, it's there to be, it's, it's a two-yard dump off, and everyone, everyone's seen it a million times, but a two-yard dump off to a guy who's the best in the league at, at elusiveness and breaking tackles, to be one-on-one against, obviously, I mean, someone like that there to be able to just capitalize as he can. So, okay, some uh, other matchup to be taken care of. Um, anything in terms of, I know just positional matchups and everything on that side, but, um, areas to be concerned about for Philly weaknesses potentially, or even areas that, uh, that might be exploited. Well, like you said before, it's just, if they do kind of get in that rut on offense to begin with, and, and the defense can't really contain Sean McVay's offense. Cause like you said, Sean McVay wants his revenge against Vic Fangio. It's been almost six years since they, they last matched up in Vic Fangio's Chicago bears held Sean McVay's Rams to about six points or whatever it was. So he's been waiting and he's talked about how great Vic Fangio is as far as a defensive mind, but he's been waiting for six years now trying to build up that list of, I'm sure of plays. He's going to be digging, digging deep in there and figuring out what he could throw at Vic Fangio. So, I mean, they're going to be pulling out all the stops because they also need this game to kind of stay alive in their division, stay alive in the NFC as far as the playoff hunt goes. So if they can, I feel like it'll be tough if they kind of take a, a two possession lead and the Eagles are kind of playing catch up especially without Devontae Smith. I feel like you kind of want to play keep away, dominate time of possession, just lean on Saquon Barkley, lean on the short completions that'll open up the play action to to those outside the number passes to A.J. Brown that have been so dominant this season. So I feel like that's kind of what their game plan should be. But if they just go three and out and allow the Rams to kind of uncharacteristically march down the field and go up 7 nothing or 14 nothing, then things can kind of spiral out of control. But I think overall... They have more than enough talent, even without Devontae Smith, to win this game and win it rather convincingly. Okay. That, see, that's what everybody wants to hear. The optimism there, win it rather convincingly. The, the line is, is uh, two and a half, I believe, at the time of this recording. 
Some places have it as, as the Eagles uh, minus three. But you say convincingly there, and, and obviously to, to end it here with the score predictions, how, how convincingly are we talking about? The official Anthony DeBona prediction, what are you going with? Well, well, this might might be too convincing, but because I, I, I think I mentioned it on your live stream as well. Yep. The Rams have, have kept eight of their 10 games within one possession. So even when they're losing, it's not like they're getting blown out. So they had one blowout win, one loss where they got blown out. Besides that, they've all been one possession games. So I'm going to have the Eagles winning 28 to 20. I know it's not, might not be convincingly okay. in, in certain people's books, but I think it'll be a pretty comfortable win for them. Maybe it'll be a late Rams touchdown to make it look a little bit closer, kind of like last week. But I'm, I'll go with 28-20 Eagles. We are crazy close in our prediction, uh, which you may know because, again, I said it in the, the live stream previously. But uh, I, I'm 27-20, so one point there off. You but, I, you know, we're still both one, within one possession. It's just one of them would require a, a two-point conversion, I guess. So I would rather have that lead. Um, but still, either way, 27-20, you're without Smitty. If you could score 30 points without Smitty, I mean, my gosh, I know that earlier I was the, – the math – is mathing to a 40 bomb, but like realistically 27 points, that should be, I think that should be good enough. Your, your defense is played at a certain level. You, you go into a game. This is, this is still a, you know, I, I think it's maybe not to the extent of like people saying, Oh, it's a prove it game for Philly. They don't have to prove anything with the defense, what they did with Washington, Cincinnati. Yes. There's some other teams that are not as great, but heck you can look at what Cleveland did against the Steelers. Teams are beating other teams. It's the NFL. So like week in and week out, you don't luck into a number one defense. You could luck into a top 15 defense, but you don't luck into a number one defense in the NFL. So to me, I'm like, it's a good test, but it's not a prove it moment. So um, I, I, but I agree with you. 27-20, that's where I'm going with. See, so Eagles get the dub there. It'll just be interesting. Just one final point that like, because it felt like when they shut down the Bengals, people were like, oh, well, they didn't have T Higgins because all of a sudden he's the best receiver in the world. And then when mm-hmm. they shut down the commanders, it's like, oh, Jaden Daniels, has 17 broken ribs. Like, that's why he didn't play well. So now the Rams are, besides their right tackle, they're in great shape. And there's an argument to be made that their backup right tackle, if they go with Warren McClendon Jr., has actually outperformed their starter. So if, if now they have a healthy Puka Nakua, they have a healthy Cooper Cup, healthy Matthew Stafford, healthy, healthy Kyron Williams, who we didn't even talk about, who's having a great year as well. So, I mean, they have a stacked offense. So I don't know what excuse people are going to make if the Eagles defense kind of does shut down the Rams, but... We'll see what happens this week. It wouldn't surprise me if we do have some excuses um, if it does happen because it's just – it's the same old, same old. You know, it, it, and then it'd be Baltimore and then there will be some excuses with that even if something happens. Um, but a lot in front of – everything in front of the Eagles. We've talked about the schedule and past recordings, um, videos there and everything else. But Detroit has kind of a gauntlet towards the end, some, some tougher, tougher games. Um, not that, that, that he, the Eagles don't, but um, it will be interesting. Get this dub – Get Smitty healthy, go to Baltimore, take care of business. Um, I like it, though. 28-20, I'm going with 27-20. Uh, for those watching, let us know your predictions. Score predictions in the comments. Also, first touchdown score. Again, reminder, shout out to Underdog uh, with the giveaway. But if you correctly pick the first touchdown score and the Eagles win, then you'll be entered into uh, winning in any NFL jersey of your choice. So um, I guess on that note, before I wrap, do you have an, any, uh, or I guess, a first touchdown score prediction who that would be? No, nobody's going to like this, but I'm going to say Kyron Williams is going to score the first touchdown. Ooh, game. ooh. Back-to-back <laughs> game. B- Brian Robinson was the, the winner. There were only like four people that said it because, you know, like who's going to pick the opposing team and the Eagles to win? But like, so back-to-back uh, um, opposing running backs are going to score first. Yeah, I sorry. Was, I was sorry winning to break a convincing to win and and – not the Rams to get up early. I'm, I was hoping for like a, you know, a, an AJ first touchdown or Saquon, but okay. Kyron Williams. Oh, I mean, hopefully I'm wrong, but we'll I see. do hope you're wrong. I, I'm saying AJ. That's, that's what I'm going with. So um, let us know. Let us know. We appreciate you guys. Hit the like button. Make sure to subscribe. Um, we'll be on the uh, game stream with Thomas later, but, uh, or a Sunday night, depending on whenever you're watching this. But um, appreciate it. And also make sure to follow Anthony again, because if you're not, you're missing out. As I appreciate said, Ed DeBona, NFL. Um, I appreciate you coming on, as always. It's a blast. Always a pleasure, man. I'm excited for Sunday night. Let's go. All right. Appreciate you guys. Until next time. Go, birds.